Well, that was one hell of a year. It's going to be hard to look back on 2020 and see anything but the bad. The chaos, death, destruction, it's honestly been awful for everyone. I hope all of you managed to stay safe out there and sane indoors. If there was one bright side to such a tragic year, it's that we all had an escape. This had to be one of the most stacked years in gaming history. From a litany of indie titles to massive AAA releases, the launch of new consoles and the Switch, well, the Switch had Animal Crossing. This year, I wanted to do everything in my power to experience as many titles in as many genres as I could, and as of now, I managed to play 40 games that were released in this year alone. Even then, there's only so much time in this world, and I didn't have the chance to play some games I really wanted to, like Watch Dogs Legion, Assassin's Creed Valhalla, 13 Sentinels, Immortals Phoenix Rising, Final Fantasy VII, Paper Mario, Microsoft Flight Simulator, Yakuza, Monster Sanctuary, and just so, so many others. And after a month of daily reviews, I'll now be ranking them all, including those that didn't get their own video. I do want to mention that this list may be in a different order than the numerical scores, because with my reviews, I try to take myself out of the equation as best I can, and there are some genres that I prefer, and some games that just strike a chord with me in a way that's difficult to describe. But those factors don't really make their way into the scores. Also, I had some issues figuring out OBS and my new Elgato at first, so the footage on some games may be a bit washed out or grainy. It's not awful, but I do apologize. With that said, whether you're here to get my opinions, learn about some games you might not have heard of, or just want to yell about how wrong I am in the comments, we've got a lot of games to get through, so let's get this thing started with a few honorable mentions. And of course, timestamps will be down in the description if you want to skip ahead. Technically, I can't put this game on the 2020 list since it came out in 2018, Game Awards, but Among Us really gained traction this year, and it's well-deserved, so it gets an honorable mention. A fun hidden role game in which a group of astronauts attempt to complete tasks while one or more imposters among them tries to kill off the crew and sabotage their operations. It's really fun, and while I wish the game had voice chat, for 5 bucks on Steam and free on mobile, I'd say you should give Among Us a try. The final honorable mention goes to a game that is hardly a game at all, more like an interactive movie. In fact, the first thing that appears upon booting it up is a message from the director asking people not to post gameplay videos or streams online for fear of spoiling the plot, hence my use of spoiler-free static images. In Death Come True, you play as a man who wakes up in a hotel room with amnesia, only to see that he's supposedly the famed serial killer Makoto Karaki, and with a woman in his room's bathtub, the police are searching for him. As the game continues, the player will occasionally be able to make various choices that affect how the story progresses, though the story itself remains set in stone from the outset, playing out in live-action video with fantastic music, cinematography, and surprisingly great effects. What really makes the game special, though, is that it's written and directed by Kazutaka Kodaka of Danganronpa fame. It has his fingerprints all over it, from the over-the-top but still engaging and entertaining characters, to the high-concept plot, to the surprising and unforgettable ways in which the story unfolds. For only 16 bucks on Steam, this is the perfect game to play with a group of friends, taking turns making decisions as you watch the story unfold over the course of a couple of hours, and it's definitely one of my favorite experiences this year. Now, let's get into the list. Totally Reliable Delivery Service works on the same premise of games like Goat Simulator and Gang Beasts, where the unwieldy nature of the controls and crazy physics are meant to make the gameplay frustratingly hilarious as you go through. Unlike those other two games, however, Totally Reliable Delivery Service fails to actually elicit a single chuckle. There are two reasons for this. First, the game simply does not work. It's broken to its core, feeling completely unfinished and buggy. And this could be funny to try out, but then the game's second major flaw comes into play. It doesn't commit to the bit. It tries its absolute damnedest to make sure it has clear objectives and goals, but rather than making achieving those goals silly and fun, it's just an exercise in frustration with every tedious second grinding on the nerves. 
Missions can take a long time to reach, and they aren't very fun when you do give them a try, if they work at all. In a game like Goat Simulator, the controls may be loose and imperfect, but they generally make our character do what the player would expect. A glitchy comedy game only works if the player's frustrations are overcome by the silliness of it all, and the moment-to-moment -moment experience is quickly carrying them to the next ridiculous set piece. Unfortunately for totally reliable delivery service, it's just a frustrating, unfinished mess. Sludge Life is a game that could have worked with a bit more time, but the details hold the game back a fair bit. Here, players are tasked with tagging a large map with graffiti while hunting down objects to reach new areas. The main problems here are with the controls and lack of explanation. A lot of the hitboxes both for tagging surfaces and jumping onto platforms can feel almost random at times, especially given the first-person perspective and actually figuring out what you're meant to do can be really frustrating in its own right, with a hidden object required to even see spots to tag at a distance. Top all of that off with a pretty ugly art style, the need to repetitively climb towers and no direction in how to proceed with the game, and Sludge Life ends up feeling like the video game equivalent of fumbling around in the dark looking for your keys. I had high hopes for Crumble, a little indie game where you play as a slime rolling through levels at incredible speeds, able to use its tongue to grapple onto objects and swing around. Sounds like a great time, but in execution, this game is an absolute mess. See, the cool mechanic of grappling? The game wants you to use that as little as possible, instead jumping between obstacles with the insanely floaty controls. Oh, you want to pick up speed? Too bad, there are minor obstacles in the way everywhere that constantly halt your progress. The game's biggest issue is that the player can grapple onto any surface, which seems fine at first, but when you take into consideration the terrible aiming reticle that seems to appear and disappear on a whim, and the fact that many objects past the first world will topple over if grappled on, it means that you're stuck grounded for most of the game. Even then, the controls on the ground aren't that great either, feeling far too loose and slow to respond for such a fast-paced game. Then there's the really lackluster camera constantly obscured by environmental objects like walls and fog. It's a real shame that Crumble couldn't live up to the fun provided in its demo, but unfortunately, despite the obvious effort put into development, it falls really short. With that said, the game has plenty of potential, and hopefully the developer can work a little harder on the core design in their next project. A quick entry, this year's remake of Trackmania is sorta kinda free to play, and it's kinda fun, but the tutorial is absolutely terrible at teaching you how to play, the monetization method is confusing as hell, and I'm gonna be honest, this game's UI confused me so much that I just didn't think it was worth the effort it would take to learn how to navigate it, so I uninstalled it after only a few hours of races. If you don't think that's fair to the game, then feel free to negate this entry on the list, but for me, these qualities are enough to say the game's not all that great and not worth your time. Up next, we have Ninjala, a free-to-play Switch exclusive advertising itself on the premise of being a melee-based battle royale. Upon hearing this and seeing the Splatoon-esque graphical style, I immediately hopped in and gave it a try, only to put it down for good a couple of hours later. Ninjala is not a battle royale game. It's actually a point-based free-for-all deathmatch game with some cool ideas, interesting if shallow melee combat, a cool aesthetic, and some major issues. It's honestly not worth going into this game in depth, but in short, the Ninjala experience is one that's all flash and no substance. Regardless of the weapon chosen, the combat never gets deeper than a puddle, like two toddlers whacking each other with wiffle ball bats until the other falls over. Maybe with a bit more combat variety, better countering options, and more functional netcode, the game could have worked, but it just gets far too boring far too quickly to really work in the modern online multiplayer landscape.
I love board games, having amassed a decent collection for myself over the years, but it always seems like one or two of the classics are missing. Well, have no fear, this year Nintendo released Clubhouse Games 51 Worldwide Classics, and it's got everything. You have staples like backgammon and chess, foreign classics like shogi which I've always wanted to learn, and even some oddball picks along with some minigames from over the years like Wii Bowling and Wii Play Tanks. There's so much here that if it worked flawlessly, I'd say it's an amazing deal. Unfortunately, it's just okay. Like, for a year full of quarantining it works out great, especially if you're trapped at home with someone else, but when the motion controls are completely broken, ruining games that worked well on the Wii over a decade ago, the game's aesthetic is deemed around white voids, many of the games either don't allow for as many players as they should, or require you to play with Joy-Cons or on the touchscreen for no reason, and every game is given an introduction with these simultaneously creepy and annoying plastic dolls, which usually act out in un necessary sketch and don't explain how the game works in the slightest, the entire package gets bogged down to just a mediocre collection. If you have kids or like board games and can nab it on sale in the eShop, it's still worth picking up to get a hold of all the classics since most of the simple games work pretty well, but as a package, this game falls far short of expectations. The point-and-click adventure genre hasn't exactly had the renaissance treatment that other old-school games seem to get. Growing up, I remember games like Monkey Island, King's Quest, and Putt-Putt being everywhere, but they seem to have died out over time. This year, we got an admirable attempt to reinvigorate this type of game with There Is No Game, Wrong Dimension. Explaining the story for this one will probably spoil it a bit, but in general, you take the role of the game's player as you try to play, while the game attempts to prevent you from doing so. Along the way, you get into various misadventures, travel into other games, and maybe have a laugh or two. However, while I did chuckle every once in a while, the game isn't really as funny as it thinks it is, and the parts that try to be genuinely touching kinda just fall flat, partially due to the mediocre voice acting. Still, if you're a fan of point-and-clicks, I'd say this is a pretty good time with plenty of cool gameplay tricks, puzzles, and out-of-the-box thinking with meta-commentary on the gaming industry as a whole, so it might be worth checking out. But as a total package, it's not much to write home about. This is an interesting one. Helltaker is a free game by Van Ripper, a sliding block puzzle game with the goal being to recruit the various demons of hell for a harem of sorts. The art style is cute, and the puzzles can get surprisingly deep and tricky, with the move limits and constant addition of new elements keeping things interesting throughout, even wrapping up with a fun, if slightly frustrating, boss fight. Honestly, there's not much to say here since the game is only about an hour long, but it doesn't get stale, serves its purpose, and as a result, definitely put the developer on my radar for the future. If you like sliding block puzzles, you can't really go wrong with giving Helltaker a shot. Up next is Primal Light, a retro-style melee-based platformer with a solid difficulty level. Honestly, you can pretty much tell what this game's about just by watching the footage. Using your character, run through a level, defeat the monsters, make it to the end, and beat the boss to progress. I had a lot of fun with this game at first, but eventually noticed that every once in a while it could misread my inputs, which feels especially unfair in such a difficult game. On top of that, the game makes a fatal mistake by sending the player back to the start of a level when they lose all their lives. I understand wanting to give players a penalty, but when deaths between lives put you right back in front of the boss at full health, the only difference after losing your last life is a tedious slog through a level you've already beaten before being able to try again. And unlike a FromSoft game, there's no grinding for more health or better stats, so it's literally just unnecessary repetition. A game is allowed to be difficult, but it should never punish failure with tedium. Still, with its gorgeous art direction, fun gameplay mechanics, and slick level design, it's a game I can recommend to those interested in the genre. Genshin Impact is an interesting game to try and place on this list. 
On the one hand, it's incredibly impressive for a free-to-play game, and it's amazing that it can run on smartphones. However, the overall design and direction essentially takes the Breath of the Wild formula, removes the best aspects of its freeform exploration, and replaces it with an infinite pile of stats, items, and skills. At its core, the game has some really fun ideas with the elemental combat, multiple characters, and decent controls, but it's all bogged down by really low frame rates even on console, a pretty bog standard anime storyline, repetitive and shallow gameplay that usually devolves into just hitting enemies and running away to regain stamina before returning to button mash, and so many stats to keep track of that increasing any of them has no significant impact on your abilities. Overall, I'd say it's a solid foundation onto which Mihoyo Studios can build, and it's still a fun enough time if you're looking for a solid RPG on the go without spending any cash. But in the grand scheme of things, it just feels like a mediocre copy of Breath of the Wild and Final Fantasy, lacking the charm, personality, and polish of either. Alright, I think I know what happened in the pitch meeting for Rocket Arena. Someone looked around the EA boardroom having prepared nothing the night before, with scribbled notes written on their palm only to look down and see a list of games. So they nervously raised their head and said, uh, okay, so it's gonna be a hero shooter-like Overwatch with, uh, Fortnite's visual style? Y yeah, yeah, and, uh, Super Smash Bros. style knockouts using nothing but, uh, rocket launchers. To which someone stood up, walked over, and whispered in their ear before sitting back down as the presenter finished with, Oh, and of course we'll charge $30 for the game while having a battle pass to unlock anything worthwhile. To which the entire room applauded. Now look, I know that sounds cynical, but Rocket Arena really does just come off as a corporate product more than a game made with any kind of passion. The characters are bland, the visual style is fine but has a lot of bugs, and the controls are a bit too floaty and gameplay too unwieldy. With that said, the game is still really fun to play. The rocket launcher concept is pushed to the limits of creativity and how it's applied, and the game modes are incredibly fun. If this were a free-to-play game, I'd actually be recommending people check it out. Unfortunately, that $30 price tag and awful unlocks without the battle pass really drag things down. I did get it for free on PS Plus, but it still felt like none of my efforts were being recorded in any meaningful way since the unlocks without the battle pass are just awful. Hell, even the skins with the Battle Pass aren't anything to write home about, and there's not even a ranked mode. All in all, despite the price already dropping down to $5, Rocket Arena's really not a game that I personally want to support and have no desire to play again. If it goes free to play, go ahead and give it a shot, but until then it stands as a testament to what I'm sure is EA's ability to meddle with even the most promising of games and make them mediocre. Does anyone remember Wii Sports Resort? Or Pilot Wings? Well, if you like those games, then I have another free title here that you might enjoy. Sky is a relaxing flight game where the overall goal is to slowly fly around an island collecting trinkets and completing short quests. The art style is gorgeous and unique, and the gameplay is pretty smooth. It can be a bit slow-paced, the simple story just kind of gets in the way of flying around, and it only lasts for about an hour. But if you just want a game to unwind with after a long day at work or class, Sky should do the trick. Looking forward to what Decoded Production has in store for us next time. Super Mario Bros. 35 is an interesting game. Similar to Tetris 99, it's a free battle royale in which 35 combatants play through the classic game in order to be the last one standing. In Tetris 99, players could attack opponents by clearing blocks, but here, players go through the original Super Mario Bros and send every enemy they defeat to their chosen victim. On top of that, since each player only has one life, coins are used to activate a randomized item box that grants players an advantage when used, while other items add time to the clock. It's really fun balancing time management, speed, and coins to ensure you stay alive, and can be exciting discovering the ins and outs of how the game works, keeping things engaging for a lot longer than you might expect. Overall, it's worth checking out, especially since the servers are shutting down in March for some reason. 
Hopefully Nintendo compiles a bunch of these retro battle royales into their own game. Maybe with different rounds eliminating players in groups until a final round determines the winner, like another game on this list. Guess we'll have to wait and see, but if you haven't tried this game out for yourself yet, I definitely say it's worth taking a look while you still can. Quantum League is a game that had me really excited after trying it out at PAX. Over the course of three rounds, players are tasked with reaching a central gold ring to claim it as their territory. The twist is that each subsequent round has clones of your character from previous rounds fighting beside you, allowing for a plethora of strategies and a massive amount of potential, since it's only in the third round that players are able to earn a point. It's a really unique idea, and honestly it's executed quite well. It takes some time to really understand the mechanics and get a handle on the strategies required to be effective, but when you manage to save your past clone, allowing it to score a final point in the match, it feels amazing. Unfortunately, the game can't be much higher on the list since the player base is so small it makes finding a match almost impossible. Like After Charge last year, I fear this is another game with a fantastic, well-executed premise that's flying far under the radar and dying as a result. Hopefully the team can figure out a way to inject some life into the player base before coming out of early access, but until then, its place in my Steam library is just a reminder of what could have been. The Pedestrian is a game that I helped to kickstart a few years ago, based entirely off of a cool little trailer featuring a restroom gender symbol running between various signs in a 3D environment to solve puzzles. Created by a team of three, the game is really impressive for such a small studio. The backgrounds, game mechanics, and art design are all pretty varied, and the puzzles can get surprisingly tricky at times. The only real issues I have with the game are some moments of tedium where it feels like the developers were worried about their game being too short, and so they slowed things down to pad out the game's length. But those moments are rare, and in the end, the pedestrian comes together as a unique, clever little puzzle game that can easily be called a Kickstarter success. Alright, I'll admit it. On a personal level, a fold apart cheats a little. This simple puzzle game revolves around the story of a couple carrying on a long-distance relationship after a work opportunity separates them. As they begin to grow apart, the game uses its puzzles as a metaphor for the characters working through their insecurities concerning their relationship. The narrative is lovely, and the paper-folding-based puzzle mechanics are something I haven't seen before, and make for some really solid head-scratchers. However, this game has the major advantage of coming out right at the time when me and my then-girlfriend were facing a very similar situation. Luckily for us, we managed to avoid the long distance, but I'd be lying if I said this game didn't bring a tear or two to my eye. I will acknowledge that this is yet another game with ridiculously slow controls and pacing for no reason besides padding its 3-hour playtime. Still, if you want to experience a great narrative, some neat puzzles, and don't mind a slow pace, a fold apart might just be for you. The subject of loss is a difficult thing to tackle. How can anyone truly convey the feeling of losing someone close to them through art? Well, that's exactly the goal of Mojikin Studios' game, When the Past Was Around. This short, $7 indie game follows a woman dealing with the loss of a loved one. We see their lives together and how she copes with her partner's passing. The gameplay is your typical point-and-click fare. Click everything, find objects, solve puzzles, and I gotta say, some of these really had me stumped for a while. But the solutions could hardly be called too obtuse. The story is pretty good too, with the ending leaving me with a few goosebumps through its beauty and music. The game can drag a bit in the beginning with a lot of slow cutscenes, vague imagery, and repetitive audio, but it all pays off in the end. And that art style is undeniably beautiful. You may not know this, but I actually covered one of Mojiken's other games, A Raven Monologue, in an indie spotlight video a few years back, and ever since I've been looking forward to what this studio will come up with next, and thanks to fun puzzles, a gorgeous art style, and a touching story, I'll continue to keep them on my radar, because when the past was around, definitely lived up to expectations.
I'll be honest, I'm not entirely sure what to call Paper Beast. Puzzle game, interactive art, VR gimmick simulator? Yeah, all of those fit pretty well. In Paper Beast, you're transferred into a world of, well, Paper Beasts. From here, you're able to drag these creatures around, using each of their unique abilities to solve puzzles and progress. The game is pretty short at around 3 hours, but in spite of that, it still manages to feel remarkably slow at times, with some puzzles taking so long to solve that they made me question if I even had the right solution. So why is it worthwhile? The game has some incredible atmosphere and knows how to truly envelop the player in its world. It's a unique experience unlike anything else, and many of the puzzles are really fun to solve, involving a lot of unique mechanics and interesting physics dynamics. Plus, that intro sequence and the god mode are a blast to mess around in. It's definitely a bit pretentious at times, but if you're looking for a new VR game that's unlike anything else on the market, and looking for something that'll leave you wanting more, I'd say Paper Beast is one to check out. I Am Dead is a difficult game to pin down. You play as Morris Lupton, the deceased former museum curator on the island of Shelmerston. After drifting around for a while as a ghost, he reunites with his old dog Sparky, who tells him that they need to find a new custodian, a person who can appease the island spirits and prevent the volcano from erupting. To do this, they travel to various locations looking into the memories of the living in order to find enough objects for Sparky to sniff out the other deceased residents, allowing them to ask if they're willing to become the next custodian. See what I meant when I said it was hard to describe? In short, you figure out which items to look for and click around the environment, using the ability to see through objects to locate what you need before contacting the spirit. There's not really much of a challenge to it, but that also prevents the game from being frustrating. There are also optional objectives in certain rooms where you can locate creatures called Grankins by cutting and rotating objects in specific ways. While the game isn't challenging, it has a distinct charm, and just feels warm and cozy to play. The voice acting, especially from Morris, is superb, and the visuals are basic, but stylized in a way that gives the whole island a life of its own. The story isn't anything moving or profound, but it does always leave you wanting to learn more. It's the perfect way to relax and just take your mind off the world by absorbing yourself in the people and culture of this little island. As such, this won't be a game for everybody, but if you're looking for the gaming equivalent of a warm, fuzzy blanket, then I'd say give I Am Dead a shot. Easily the most disappointing game of the year for me is Sackboy A Big Adventure. What looked to be a new take on the Little Big Planet mascot in the vein of Super Mario 3D World didn't turn out awful. Far from it. The game has enough charm, solid level design, and fun to be had to actually recommend playing if you can get it at a discount. But every time I started to actually have fun, something bad would be just around the corner. The plot is pointless, which is fine for this type of game, but the characters, for how much they talk, have nothing interesting or funny to say. Sackboy is adorable and the costumes are all great, with plenty of customization options, but the controls are far too loose and the depth perception is a massive issue. Playing co-op makes things a lot more fun, even making the extremely slow pace and floaty controls sensible, but it's local only for now and can't change how bland everything is, which is really the crux of the issue. Everything here, aesthetically, thematically, and gameplay-wise, feels uninspired, even when it's creatively implemented like in the music levels. New gameplay ideas are around every turn, and most of them are used in cool and unique ways, but spoiled by rudimentary design, iffy controls, and a complete lack of surprises, meaning that Sackboy's Big Adventure is one that establishes a fantastic framework for a sequel, but misses the mark in too many ways to truly give it a thumbs up. Sometimes a game comes along that leaves me absolutely stunned. A game that leaves me asking how the developers even pulled off such a feat. Pumpkin Jack is that kind of game, but not for the reasons you may be thinking. Because while the game itself is a fun, varied, short, linear 3D platformer, the most impressive thing about it is that it was almost entirely made by one person. Nicholas Mayason... Nick... Nicholas Mayas... Mayasonier... 
Nicholas Meissonier clearly put a ton of work into this project and it shows. A unique setting, fantastic soundtrack, and eye-catching presentation all back up some incredibly fun medieval-style gameplay. While it only takes about 4-5 to five hours to beat and does have some of the worst V-Sync I've ever seen, each level has a new set of mechanics introduced and a unique boss fight at the end, keeping things fresh. I'll be keeping my eye out to see what Nicholas has in store next, but for now, if you hadn't heard of Pumpkin Jack before seeing this video and you're looking for a solid 3D platformer fix, you've gotta put this on your radar. Much like Rocket Arena, Worms Rumble is an online multiplayer game released for free on PS Plus in December of this year. But unlike Rocket Arena, Worms Rumble is a great game. I'm a big fan of the Worms franchise, but Rumble is unlike anything else in the series. You still have side-scrolling gameplay, health bars, the little cute voices, and a lot of the returning weapons like the Holy Hand Grenade, Banana Bomb, and Jetpack, but rather than a turn-based tactical shooter, this is an all-out deathmatch. The controls work surprisingly well, with the worms feeling agile and responsive thanks to the snappy controls and roll move. The weapons are all distinct and most of them are really fun to use, managing to feel unique despite the massive variety. Movement is handled with the left stick and aiming with the right, and your goals change depending on the mode selected. Deathmatch is pretty typical, but players can score points by dealing damage in addition to getting kills, encouraging aggressive play. Then there's the last worm standing rounds, which can be played on teams of three or solo. This is your typical battle royale, with different zones being filled with poisonous gas over time. Not only are all of these games fun to play, but they slowly unlock the vast array of cosmetics with the absolute omission of microtransactions. That's right, the only way to earn more items in this game is by playing, which is something you'll definitely want to do. There are the occasional glitches with firing inputs, the screen can get overwhelmed with too much going on, and the weapons and items can be difficult to make out with everything so zoomed out, but Worms Rumble is a game that I would have happily paid for even if it weren't on PS Plus, and I recommend you do the same. This is one of the strangest games I've played in a while. A PS5 launch title that's honestly ugly as sin, but with unique action puzzle gameplay, a surprisingly intriguing story, and some wonderfully funny lines sprinkled throughout, Bug Snacks is far more than the meme it appears to be at first glance. Your character travels to an island to learn about the mysterious creatures called Bug Snacks from a famous explorer named Lisbeth, but upon arriving she's gone missing and the town's residents have all left. Your mission is to track down the residents, bring them home, and solve the mystery of the missing Lisbeth. This is accomplished by using the various tools at your disposal to catch the elusive bug snacks and feed them to the seemingly addicted residents. The clever puzzles, constantly expanding tool set, and sheer amount of variety in how they're used can make for some real brain scratchers here and there, and it even has some really fun boss fights. And while the experience can be slow to start and the bug snacks AI is frustratingly inconsistent at times, with a game this charming, you're really missing out if you don't give Bug Snacks a try. Rhythm games always seem to find new ways to innovate. Dance Dance Revolution, Guitar Hero, Parappa, Beat Saber, and now, BPM Bullets Per Minute. A Doom-inspired roguelike first-person shooter where you stay on the beat or die trying. Fast-paced action and some incredibly satisfying shooting mechanics are all wrapped neatly in this unique Hell-themed art style. The main gimmick is that you can only shoot and reload to the beat of the music. Losing your rhythm means nothing happens and puts you in danger. Each playthrough is randomized and some of the combinations can really leave you screwed over, but at least spending money in the shops opens up more slots to be purchased in future runs. With a solid, if slightly repetitive soundtrack, well-designed boss fights, and a litany of weapons, power-ups, and characters at your disposal, tackling these eight incredibly challenging levels is an absolute blast. Just make sure to change the rhythm detection setting to loose when first starting out. My sense of rhythm may not be perfect, but I think the game may have a touch of input delay that takes some getting used to. The art style can also be a bit overwhelming with some of the enemies blending into the environments, and it can get a bit repetitive, but either way, it's a really fun and super unique experience.
If you've been subscribed for a while, you may remember that I'm a big fan of the Playdead Studio games Limbo and Inside. Something about the puzzle platforming vibe with dark undertones and brutal deaths upon failure, with just enough time to get everything done, is incredibly engaging and entertaining. This year we saw the release of Stella, a game clearly inspired by the Playdead titles and one that pulls off the formula surprisingly well. Honestly, there's not a ton to talk about here since if you've played the Playdead games, you know what you're in for. A dark platformer with split-second puzzles, some trial and error gameplay, and an ambiguous story. Although there were some noticeable moments where the game failed to really telegraph what the player should do, more so than in the other games. And while the art style is impressive, the controls can feel a little slow, and the story and theming never really spark a sense of curiosity. Even still, Stella is a game I can easily recommend to fans of Playdead style games. It's no surprise to anyone at this point that Cyberpunk 2077 was released in an abysmally unfinished state. With numerous retailers offering refunds on the game, it's a wonder how CD Projekt Red ever expected to get away with their actions. They built up so much hype in the eight years since its announcement that expecting anything less than the extreme backlash they received is unimaginable. But we all know that. I've seen plenty of reviews where they say the game would be incredible if they just managed to iron out these bugs, something that I'm confident CDPR will eventually do. However, I wholeheartedly disagree with that sentiment, because even if the bugs were fixed and the game ran at a perfect 60 FPS through and through at its best settings, what you'd be left with is a fun game with a ton of potential that's held back by dated design, awkward progression, and trying to do too much at once. Don't get me wrong, Cyberpunk is an impressive game in terms of scope, scale, and ambition. At its best, it's a stellar mix of Fallout, Watch Dogs, and Grand Theft Auto. Night City is massive and full of things to do. There's a ton of variety in how you build your character, and the story can be a blast. But for every one of those elements, there's something that takes away from the experience right around the corner. The story is engaging and entertaining, but it tries to use spectacle and shock to make up for a lack of imagination. Full of binary or tertiary choices that all lead to one of a small number of predetermined paths. Night City itself feels like it was designed by an edgy 12 year old with guns and drugs for sale on every corner, gratuitous sex scenes that serve no narrative purpose, and a complete lack of creativity outside of the basics for a futuristic dystopia. And while that would be fine if Night City's various gigs and encounters were more entertaining, or the environments interesting and fun to explore, the game fails to give the player much direction or reason to want to progress. Luckily, the characters are well written, especially the main partners you'll have with you for the ride. Pan Am, Jackie, Dexter Deshawn, they're all great and well performed. Even Keanu Reeves' Johnny Silverhand, while a completely irredeemable prick from start to finish, kinda grew on me by the end to the point where it felt like a love-hate relationship rather than a hate-hate one. As far as the gameplay goes, the shooting is fun, but the weapon choice is almost entirely about the types of weapon and their DPS, and once you find something powerful, enemies become an absolute joke. Melee is an option, but it's incredibly awkward in first person and doesn't offer many benefits that aren't better taken care of with a shotgun. The world is massive, but most of the gigs are rinse and repeat stealth combat encounters. The driving can also be a chore. With a zoomed-in minimap, you never really know when a turn is coming up, leading to a lot of slamming on the brakes or into concrete before reversing and turning around. Even if you do see the turn coming, the controls are so stiff that it might not matter anyway. A lot of this frustration could have been solved with a GPS marker on the road, but for some inexplicable reason, that feature is exclusively relegated to the racing missions. The worst of it all is the stealth. I chose to go for an intelligence engineering build, meaning that I could craft and upgrade weapons or hack my way into different locations. While it was cool to see the different dialogue options offered to me due to my background in skills, the skills themselves weren't all that useful. Crafting doesn't mean much when ingredients are incredibly rare and you can always find more powerful weapons lying on the ground with dead bodies. Hacking can be fun, but often ends in frustration since enemies are alerted to your presence upon being hacked made even worse when the game commits the cardinal sin of stealth. Having all enemies know your exact location the second one of them notices you, combined with them never losing sight of you until they're dead. 
no hiding, very few opportunities to take out enemies with silenced weapons, and close range stealth is entirely handled by the typical sneak up and grab option. So while it could be fun to spread demon hacks into enemies one by one until an area is clear, the high risk isn't worth the effort since going in and blasting with a pulse rifle gets the job done in one tenth of the time. When it comes down to it, Cyberpunk 2077 is not a bad game. There's a lot to love here, and when it's fixed, I can definitely recommend it to anyone who's a fan of Bethesda-style games or GTA. It just lacked the direction necessary to make for a truly special or unique experience. Shady Part of Me is yet another Playdead-style puzzle platformer, but this time with a unique gimmick. The puzzles take place in both 2D and 3D, with each side affecting the other. You play as two girls, one is a 2D shadow, and the other is a 3D girl who's afraid to step into the light. Doing things like flipping switches affects both girls' worlds, and moving objects in 3D changes how the shadows move. The puzzles are sufficiently challenging, though skew towards the easy side if you exclude the optional objectives to reach the collectible paper cranes, and due to a huge variety of gimmicks and tricks introduced over the game's 4-hour runtime, things rarely get boring, but they never really combine these unique concepts to make something truly special. Unfortunately, this is also another game that slows down character movement far too much in order to make the game longer, which is a particular sticking point when the game has you shuttle both characters down long hallways one by one after solving a puzzle. The sketched art style could use more color to make locations feel more distinct, but it's still excellent, with lots of cool visual effects, and the music is lovely, if sparse. The story is also intriguing and kept me interested all the way through, with some solid voice acting, but the ending was a little too vague, leaving it somewhere between surface level and the philosophical interpretive level without falling squarely into either camp, giving the illusion of being deep without having much to say. Still, the game has a lot of charm and is a delight to play, with the unique mechanic being utilized in just about every way imaginable. While the flaws are numerous, they're all really minor, and in the end, Shady Part of Me is still an imaginative, engaging experience that I highly recommend. I think VR is one of the coolest innovations in gaming in a long time, but developers have struggled to really make it feel worthwhile. Sure, there are some games where the advanced immersion really helps, and Beat Saber is a thing, but it's pretty rare that a game manages to really feel like VR is integral to the experience while also maintaining a level of quality worth writing home about. Unfortunately, the only headset I have is a PSVR, so I couldn't try out Half-Life Alex this year, which probably would have been a contender for my game of the year. But what I did get to play is Iron Man VR. This game, cliched lines aside, really makes you feel like Iron Man. And that's no exaggeration. You want to shoot? Point and shoot. You want to fly? Move your hands and fly. You want to turn around? Yeah, okay, we'll get there eventually, but either way, the game is an absolute blast to play, and the closest to the feeling of flying through the air I think many of us will ever get. Sure, there are plenty of issues like the PSVR's limitations, the bland story, ugly graphics, and Tony's carpal tunnel really doing a number on him, but nothing can compare to the experience that Iron Man VR offers, and if you have a PSVR, I definitely say it's a must-play. Yet another VR title in a year pretty stacked with releases. Star Wars Squadrons was an absolutely terrible experience through and through. As the second VR game to ever give me motion sickness, once I was done playing, I felt like I just rode a Tilt-A-Whirl while completely hammered after eating a filet of fish. Then a few days later they patched it on PS5, and man this game is great! I'll be honest, even after the fixes, the game is very surface level. The most boring Star Wars stories since Solo, repetitive missions, and some really cheap deaths or vague instructions during missions, but none of that matters because this is still one of the most immersive VR experiences ever. The ships are all a delight to pilot, and the sounds and visuals enhance the experience to all new heights, being ripped straight from the movies. The customization options in different ships add a ton of replay value, and after finishing the campaign, it's going online that's the real treat. 
Getting to test your might in 5v5 matches against real opponents is a blast and keeps things interesting long after the credits roll. All in all, the game is pretty average without VR, but if you have a headset thanks to the new patch, I'd say this is a must play. You know, I've never really understood Animal Crossing. The slow pace, the silly aesthetic, the tedium, it's always been pretty boring to me. I've played a couple of the games in the past, but put them down only a few days after picking them up. It's just so annoying to have to wait literal, real-world days to advance in a game, and I really don't find it all that engaging. And even with this year's New Horizons, I'm nowhere near as invested as others have been. I won't be making an entire cityscape or terraforming each and every detail of my island. I won't be fishing for hours on end just to try and fill up the game's aquarium. And I certainly won't be playing it much, if at all, in the future. My island is surely a pile of weeds full of lonely villagers at this point, but what I can't deny is that in a year full of so much turmoil, and as I move further into an adult life so full of constant chores and bills and other such things requiring my attention, there was a solid few weeks this year where Animal Crossing was a safe place to just hide away and relax. Check in on the characters, pluck some weeds, and nab some fruit before shutting the game off and getting back to whatever life has in store for me next. So maybe I still don't fully get Animal Crossing, and you know, if it weren't for the pandemic, I may not have enjoyed it as much as I did, or maybe wouldn't have played it at all. The agonizingly slow pacing, ridiculously tedious online multiplayer, frustration with breaking tools, and strict times for in-game events are all still there. But I do think that I now at least understand why it appeals to so many people, and it gave me a bit of comfort in an otherwise tumultuous time, something I think we can all appreciate every now and again. Last year's Resident Evil 2 Remake was a smash hit, giving a much-needed update to the classic title and bringing some fantastic new ideas along with it. Resident Evil 3's remake is very similar with beautiful graphics, updated level design, and a switch to an over-the-shoulder third-person camera. Unfortunately, it's not able to hit the same highs as last year's release, but that doesn't mean it's not a great time. Look, I know Nemesis isn't as intimidating as Mr. X was in the previous game, and this game focuses more heavily on action than horror, and it's much shorter than it should be, but it's still a really fun experience. If you played 2 and are looking for more of that, then I can definitely recommend 3 as a solid follow-up, but I will say to temper your expectations and know that it's definitely the inferior experience. Still, with exhilarating set pieces, a good amount of scares, engaging puzzles, and game mechanics, the Resident Evil 3 Remake is well worth your time and money. Just avoid the multiplayer. It's pretty boring. If Little Big Planet was Media Molecule's experiment with making level creation accessible and entertaining, Dreams is their magnum opus. This isn't just some cute game where players can stitch together various pre-made assets to create levels. It's a full-on game engine with the tools to create assets, music, levels, animations, full games, and more without needing to write a single line of code. It's absolutely phenomenal. For $40, you get access to not only one of the best learning tools for new coders, but some incredibly fun games as well. While I'm not one for actually creating games here, since I know how to code and would prefer to use Unity, I can't deny how tempting it is since the game makes things so simple. But even if you stick to just playing what others have made, you'll find plenty to love here. Plus, the VR support is an absolute joy. Sure, some of the levels can look a bit samey, and the Dream Surfing interface could use some work with some folders to sort saved games, but if you've ever wanted to make a game and want to learn the logic behind it before learning to code, or if you simply want to experience the creations of one of the most diverse, talented, and passionate communities in gaming, Dreams is a game you need to check out.
Fall Guys is definitely the most difficult game to place on this year's list. A super unique experience, this 60-man Mario Party-style battle royale took the gaming world by storm when it was released in early August, likely boosted by the fact that it was free on PS Plus. In fact, I was planning to buy the game until I saw that it was free, so it worked out pretty well for me. And what resulted was one of the most mixed gaming experiences of my life. With some incredible highs due to the fantastic level design, wonderfully fun art style, and super catchy music being placed between lows interspersed throughout, from server issues, poorly thought out game mechanics, some malfunctioning controls, and a serious lack of features. I even made an entire video on the game trying to suggest potential fixes to the developers. All in all, whether you got the game for free or paid for it, Fall Guys is absolutely worth your time. And the patches and season updates that they've released since have been fantastic. But due to the issues mentioned, I feel like the game's longevity is on a time limit without some major future patches. The team's already done a lot to make sure some of the less interesting rounds are more fun, but we'll have to wait and see if it manages to survive with time. Rip and Tear. Those words are so perfect to describe the fundamental principle of Doom Eternal, it's uncanny. This year, I not only got to give this game a shot, but did so after trying out the 2016 reboot as well. Having played both, I see Eternal as a major upgrade in nearly every way to an already stellar game. Blazing fast gameplay will have you speeding around the environment, ripping apart demons in just about every way imaginable. With a new dashing ability allowing for much improved aerial traversal and, as a result, even more speed. While there are certainly things I prefer about the first game, like the collectible hunting and the lack of a marauder, Doom Eternal is an incredible follow-up that does everything in its power to innovate where it can on such a classic formula. There's just nothing quite like grappling yourself over to an enemy just to blow them into chunks like a demonic stripper coming out of a guts-filled birthday cake. If you haven't played the Doom reboot games and have any interest in the FPS genre whatsoever, I can't recommend these two games highly enough and I'm eagerly looking forward to the next installment so I can dive back into hell and rip and tear all over again. I'll be honest, I haven't quite finished Demon Souls yet, but despite giving up on the other From Software games I've played in the past, I'm determined to make this the one that I conquer. Unfortunately, I couldn't review it as a result, but that's fine, because reviewing Demon's Souls would be a nightmare. See, when you finally learn the ins and outs of the game and start rolling through levels one by one, it's an absolute blast. The combat is slow, but measured. The graphics are absolutely gorgeous. The UI is... well, it's part of why reviewing this game would be so tough. See, I have no problem with a game being difficult. Cuphead, Neo, even the Lion King on Genesis. I've beaten all of them and had a great time. But for every moment of Demon Souls that feels challenging but fair, the lack of direction, incredibly vague UI, and clunky approach to explaining its mechanics rear their heads and make me wonder if I'm grinding because I failed, or because the game failed to properly explain itself. There are also issues like enemies being able to hit you through walls, or spells not telling the player their range despite fizzling out, or being unable to target enemies outside of a pathetically small bubble. These are all super annoying, but I can't really fault the game too much because it's just being a faithful remake. Sometimes I think FromSoft might be better off making boss rush games instead, but then I reach an area like the foreboding Shrine of Storms, the twisting castle walls of the Boletarian Palace, or the Lovecraftian Nightmare Prison in the Tower of Latria. I'm still torn on the concept overall, but in the end, when the boss fights do finally come around, they're all super unique and an absolute blast, making all of the trials and tribulations preceding them fade away. It's not a flawless game, but it is a fantastic experience for the most part, and a solid starting point for anyone looking to get into the Souls-like genre. Just don't be afraid to look up a walkthrough. If anything, it makes an already great game even better.
I didn't mention it earlier, but this year was the first time I ever played a roguelike game. First was BPM, but later on I heard a bunch of buzz surrounding a game called Hades and figured I'd check it out, only to be blown away. As Zagreus, son of Hades, you're repeatedly attempting to escape the grasp of the underworld and reach the surface, with each death resulting in being sent right back to the start. The combat is fast and fluid, and the amount of variety would be enough to make your head spin, though the game does a fantastic job of introducing its core concepts over time without ever feeling slow-paced. The story and characters are also really fun to check out, each of their relationships with Zag being unique and giving a real sense of character despite their limited screen time. Between runs, players are also able to upgrade certain abilities, unlock new weapons with entirely unique powers and movesets, and give gifts to the various souls hanging around in the hopes of receiving gifts in return, all of which goes a long way to aid in future escape attempts. Of course, there are minor things that could be touched up, like the slow pace of deepening relationships with other characters, some boons needing a bit more explaining, and the natural problem of randomized upgrades combining with the massive variation inevitably leading to some runs just feeling unfairly difficult compared to others, but most of these are either nitpicks or just symptomatic of the genre, and every time you beat a boss, there's nothing quite like it, especially when finishing off Dear Old Dad for the first time, unlocking a surprisingly fleshed out postgame. Brutally tough, but ridiculously fun, Hades is easily one of the best games of the year. Astro's Playroom is the best console packing game ever made. This little platformer is an absolute delight to play, feeling like a mix of Mario Sunshine and Galaxy, with a fun soundtrack, engaging gameplay, and even a decent bit of challenge at times. Astro makes for an adorable mascot, and I really hope he becomes the face of PlayStation going forward. As you go through each of the four worlds, the PS5's unique capabilities are shown off one by one, and any Sony fan will find tons of little scenes scattered around, referencing nearly every Sony franchise from major titles like Uncharted and Metal Gear Solid to indie titles like Flower and Journey. Despite having a bunch of other AAA games waiting for me, I still went and platinum the entire game because it was so much fun. And the time trials make the game a perfect candidate for speedrunning as well. Astro's Playroom is a love letter to PlayStation, and it's a must-play for anyone with a PS5. Marvel's Spider-Man is an amazing game. The fluid animations, fun, rhythmic combat, and unbelievable rendition of New York City made for an unforgettable experience. But now there's a new Spider-Man in town, and his name is Miles Morales. This game improves on nearly everything about the first. The story is just as interesting, the graphics are gorgeous with a breathtaking draw distance, and the new powers are an absolute delight to try out. They fixed issues with the original, such as stealth encounters always ending in a brawl to make this a more streamlined, fast-paced game. Plus, with the PS5's fancy new SSD, getting around the city to complete side objectives is faster than ever before. Not only that, but the game is brimming with personality. The way he leaps off of rooftops and flips backwards to face the camera before falling into a headfirst dive is just full of the exaggerated swagger of a black teen. And while that line's been memed to hell and back, it's undeniable that Miles' heritage does add a lot of flavor to this game, making for a unique experience all his own. If you have the PS5, then this is THE launch title of the generation, and one of the best games this year. Here's hoping we'll get to try out some online co-op in the inevitable sequel. Ghost of Tsushima has received a surprising amount of hype and praise for a new IP, and it is absolutely deserved. After spending most of the game's beginning unconscious, Jean Sakai decides to abandon the samurai code by using a combination of stealth and combat to become the monstrous ghost, striking fear into the invading Mongols led by the grandson of Genghis Khan himself. And I haven't seen a game work so hard to innovate where it can in a long time. If Miles Morales is a fantastic refinement of the systems established by its predecessor, Ghost of Tsushima is a reimagining of two fundamental gameplay elements, combat and exploration. 
The swordplay in this game is unlike anything I've ever played. A sort of combination of the Arkham and Souls-like games with a robust moveset and counter system, enhanced by a wide variety of tools and options along with the fantastic style and game feel, that manages to perfectly balance the line between feeling vulnerable and powerful. Going from getting killed by simple swordsmen and bears in the beginning to taking out large groups of Mongol brutes with ease feels so natural that you hardly notice the improvement until going back to finish early side missions, even if there is a lot of cheesing by running in circles to avoid being surrounded by large groups. On top of that, the world itself is easily the most beautiful I've ever seen in a game. The vibrant colors make each new location memorable, with the use of wind as a guide to the next destination being a genius way of avoiding a cluttered UI. And while I do feel bad for whoever has to rake up all these leaves, the foliage and particle effects top everything off with a style that's both unique and beautiful. In fact, it makes the black and white Kurosawa mode paying homage to the game's inspiration a lesser experience, even if the option is undeniably cool. On top of that, while most missions do tend to follow the same formula of going to a place and talking to a random NPC before finding a group to fight, the various tools available between stealth and combat allow players to keep things interesting by changing their approach, with no clear dominant strategy becoming the default. It's absolutely fantastic! The story is also great, if a bit generic, and same goes for the characters. While they are engaging enough to make the story enjoyable, surprises were few and far between. And though there are a few bugs to be fixed in traversal and combat, the camera can get blocked while fighting, and the game could use a little more variety in its mission structures, especially for the collectibles, no other game this year made me want to jump back in to 100% it more. This was clearly a labor of love, with Sucker Punch even pushing numerous free patches since release, including additional difficulty modes, new game plus, and even a surprisingly fun co-op horde mode. I can't wait to see what they have in store for us next, because Ghost of Tsushima knocks it out of the park. I mean, I made a two hour long video explaining why this game is a masterpiece and one of the best gaming experiences I've ever had. Were you expecting something else? The Last of Us Part 2 is a game that I genuinely believe to be the peak of what AAA game development is capable of in the modern day. Much like with its predecessor, this game sent off its console generation with an incredible experience from start to finish. With a story that rivals the first game in many ways, The Last of Us Part II took a lot of risks that most publishers and developers would have never even considered, and they really paid off. While not everyone agrees with the choices made, even without the story, you have an outstanding cinematic action-stealth hybrid game with some of the most beautiful visuals the gaming industry has to offer. Look, if you didn't like this game, that's fine, go make your own list. But for me, The Last of Us Part II is both the most engaging experience I had while playing a game this year, and the one that will stick with me the longest as I continue to ruminate on how it made me feel and what it means to me. In fact, I prefer it over the first game. As a result, The Last of Us Part II is my undisputed game of the year for 2020. You know, it's kind of funny that the top three included the holy trinity of PlayStation devs, Insomniac, Sucker Punch, and Naughty Dog, and I think just looking at these companies can tell us a lot about the video game industry as a whole. Seeing the massive leaps and bounds made by these companies from their humble beginnings to end up where they are now is absolutely mind-blowing. And the same holds true for the rest of the industry as well. It proves that whenever someone says there aren't any good games or new ideas in gaming, it just means they're looking in the wrong places. Fresh ideas, innovations, and improvements to both hardware and software are constant, year after year. I mean, just look at the number of notable games released this year, and those are just the ones I managed to keep track of. It just goes to show that as far as we've come, we'll continue to push the art form forward to new, unimaginable heights in the future. And in a year so full of terrible news and tragedy, 
we know that there's something to look forward to. And even when times get rough, thousands of people will be working hard to give us an escape from the real world, if only for a moment. And I want to be part of that group. This past year, I dabbled in learning game development here and there, but in 2021, while I still plan to release videos on my erratic and sparse schedule, I also intend to really dive into game development head first, and I'm determined to release a game by the end of the year. Whether it's a free minigame on Itch.io, or a full-fledged magnum opus, I'm not sure. But I'll let you all know when it's finished, and follow me on Twitter for little updates along the way. While I probably won't play as many games next year as I did in 2020, I still plan to play a bunch, so leave your recommendations in the comments below, and let me know what your favorite 2020 releases were. With that said, I think we all have a much brighter future ahead, but for the time being, I hope you all stay safe, and as always, have a mighty nifty 2021.